Hello, welcome to the Big Scuba Show. Hi, my name's Alex Hildred. I'm an archaeologist, quite often an under underwater archaeologist, and I'm here tonight with Gemma and Ian on the Big Scuba Project to talk to you about the Mary Rose and underwater archaeology. So here we Today's episode is sponsored by Narked at 90, so let's find out a bit more about them. Narked at 90, their tagline has been beyond technical, which describes them pretty well. John Routley and Brent Hudson launched the company over 20 years ago. They are both technical divers who have logged thousands of mixed gas dives between them over a 30-year period. Using their engineering know-how and diving expertise have developed bespoke personal, commercial and military diving equipment and products of a universally recognised, unparalleled calibre. Their ability to be adapted and versatile with their developments led them to support the NHS during COVID. Using their superior knowledge of breathing and oxygen monitoring systems to help develop emergency ventilators, they also design and supply the sneaky stuff used by defence-based development groups throughout the Western world, although they can't tell us much about that. If you're thinking of moving across to tech diving or completely new to diving, Narked at 90 can advise and guide on the best equipment and setup for your personal or commercial requirements. Narked at 90 have unparalleled experience of shearwater dive computers and are the longest serving and sole and UK European service centre for those. They are happy to offer technical support, servicing, repairs and upgrades to all shearwater computers, past and present. Narked at 90 stock shearwater computers, but are also stockers and technical support centre for many other manufacturers, including Divesoft, JJCCR, Hollis, Revo and Kiss Rebreathers. Based centrally in the UK, Narked at 90 also offer full rebreather head servicing for selected manufacturers. Bespoke cable assemblies. Advice on specific fitting requirements. Suggestions and guidance for home builds. Computer laser cutting and engraving. Pressure testing to simulate 400 metre dives. So, Narked at 90, a reputation built on supporting both manufacturers and divers worldwide. Go to narkedat90.com and make sure you are following their social media to keep up to date with their latest news and offers. Narked at 90, large enough to cope, small enough to care. Hello everyone, welcome back to the Big Scoop podcast. My name is Ian, I am your dive master and host of this podcast and uh, welcome. Thanks for downloading and with me, because I'm never alone on these things, is my co-host. Uh, Gemma, hello, good morning. Oh, good day. Good day, good day. Uh, on a very damp and, uh, well, I was going to say, autumnal morning, but... It's a bit grey, Sunday morning in the UK on the East Coast, yes. Yeah, it's a bit wet here this morning. Um, so thank you for downloading this episode, number 146. Um, coming up, we are re-releasing a episode that we um, put out and created last autumn yes. and uh, to do with the mary rose museum a very well it's a very famous ship that got um uh which basically capsized a very henry the eighth ship and back in 1981 i believe wasn't it 1981 when it was raised yeah when it was raised <laughs> 40 years ago yeah uh it was raised and then um uh very lovingly and through lots of time and money and water and everything else that goes in <laughs> to these th projects um it was restored and uh, been preserved for and it's co constantly monitored and looked yeah. after and manicured yeah. and massaged to make sure it survives <laughs> for years to come yeah, and you've seen it a few years ago. I went to see it um, a, a couple of, well, a month, month ago um, and saw the exhibition. And the reason that we're re-releasing this episode is on Friday, the 31st of March, 2023, the Mary Rose Museum opened a new experience where you can actually experience diving the Mary Rose. It's a 4D experience. So you sit in a, I think it's a 40-seater studio cinema 
where the seats vibrate and you yeah. feel um, senses, or you smell, noises, and even bubbles. So it's a brand new experience that um, is all quite new and uh, hopefully it'll be quite exciting. Should I read uh, what's actually on their website? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so this is all about, and this, if you go to um, maryrose.org, uh, you can get all the information that you need, uh, not about just the uh, Mary Rose 4D experience, the new one that's coming out that Gemma's just been talking about, actually a bit about the ship and actually about the museum, mm. how you can book your tickets, how you can find the museum because it's in Portsmouth and Portsmouth is a very historical part of the UK. It's the home base of uh, the Royal Navy, mm-hmm. has been for uh, hundreds of years and um, many of our warships have gone out from there and uh the victory is there nelson's yes yeah, boat, yeah um ship is 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 there in dry store um so let me just read you this bit and um bear with surfacing 31st of march 2023 dive into the untold story of the finding excavation and recovery of henry the eighth's favorite ship in our new immense 4d cinema experiences dive the mary rose 4d hear the stories of the people who dived on the ship from the tudor divers of 1545 through to today Mm. search alexander mckee and his team of volunteers then enter our new state-of-the-art 4d theater and join the divers as they discover the first timbers excavate the 34 meter long shipwreck recover her treasures and return the mary rose to the surface for the first time in 437 years all brought to life with a combination of archive footage and cgi as well as multi-sensory features including sound smells bubbles (laughs) wind and movement (laughs) <laughs> dive the and I think they got one of them things that when you sit there, it kind of sprays. Like, yeah, 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 so yeah. I was going to take a bottle of water and just go <laughs> yeah. get you as you're not looking. <laughs> so hold on, not finished. Dive the Mary Rose 4D tells the stories of all those who were instrumental in bringing the Mary Rose to the surface of the Solent acting as a lasting legacy for the hundreds of individuals involved in the world's largest underwater excavation and recovery. Book your tickets today. How much are tickets? Should we have a look? They're all included. They're included as the main museum entrance fee. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to look, see how much they are. It's 10 to five um, Mm -hmm. for most opening times. Uh, If you're in the area, definitely get down there and go and have a look um i'm I'm sure you will agree um it's an absolutely fantastic uh, yeah it is and parking was easy um you can pay a higher fee when you go in to see all the museums on that site so there's the the navy museum there's a aircraft carrier it's amazing yeah Yeah, it is it is um so just have a look choose your tickets so uh Attraction day adult is £24. Mm. Attraction day child is £19. If you're a senior, if you're a senior, uh, 23 uh, Cares, <laughs> um, I believe, are free. Under threes are free as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and I think the main, if you want to do all the attractions, it's like £44. But that gives you access for a whole year. So you can keep going back. Yeah. yeah. There is a lot to see. And I remember that. And... Um, you know, and I think it's so well put together. Mm. You, know, you you get the atmosphere, and there's the creaks and the noise of yeah, uh, yeah. you know of of the ship as you as you look, and uh, and it's just brilliant. You know, some uh, so well put, so well thought out and put together. I, I, I can't sing enough. Yeah, and there's obviously lots of um, uh, pieces that they've brought up from the seabed. You know, pots, there's clothing, bones, and it was just a, incredible. So it's not just the structure of the ship that you can see, it is everything that was within that ship and the history of the people on there. And it, yeah, it just is mind blowing. Um, I met 
Alex Hildred, one of the divers, and Sally Tyrrell when I was down there uh, at the end of February. And that just merely scratches the surface, the amount that you see in the museum. They've got huge amounts of storage elsewhere with other um, artefacts in. Yeah. And when you listen to this um, episode that we put together with Alex, um, she explains uh, that there is so much still mm. um, on the seabed. You know, yeah. they still they, they rent part of the you know, that whole area off the Crown Estate. And there's two reasons for that is uh, one, it stops anyone else um, just going there and using it as some kind of pleasure diving place. And then all that history just gets lost and mm. it protects us, protects that for some stage. Hopefully one day they may have the funds to go down again and recover some more, you know, yeah. and, and um, keeps that open. <clears throat> We heard Ross Kemp, he's a TV personality in the UK, and he yeah. actually has created his first episode of um, is it Shipwreck Hunters, yes. Treasure Hunters, yeah. that comes out, I think, early April, and his first episode is he... Oh, I had, I've got a selfie with old Ross, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and he, he spoke about the uh, diving at the Go Diving show back in early March, and, yeah, when the series comes out on TV... Um, I think his first dive is on the Mary Rose. With Mr. Mitchell? Huh? Mr. Mitchell? <laughs> Mr. Mitchell. Oh. Yeah, EastEnders fans. <laughs> we spoke to... <laughs> uh, <laughs> we spoke oh. to Christina Zanato at the Go Diving Show and Patrick Whitman, and they had no idea about EastEnders. No. So it's very much a UK institution, but not necessarily a worldwide phenomenon how has that ever lasted so long Goodness really? it's got to be one of the most negative dark programs depressing ever anyway and how is that still on telly i'll never know apologies if you're an eastenders fan but we are no, no i stand by <laughs> what you say be honest no sorry i don't think it does your mental health any good watching no EastEnders. anyway so yeah so ross kemp was there and uh he wanted his he, he wanted a selfie with me and i said <laughs> Not again! Stop! You, you really, really need a personality, podcast personality. Really need to stop bugging me about this. But anyway, let's have a photo. You know, it's good. It's good that we're friends. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, anyway moving on. <laughs> so the Mary Rose. So we've covered the the new experience that's opening on the thirty first of March. Uh, that's why we're repurposing um, a previous podcast episode. So we hope you enjoy it. So that will follow along shortly. But... Did I say that? Did I tell you that Ross looks so much like my brother? So much like my brother. Like, <laughs> like, must... Honestly, they're like identical. It's like, looking at Ross makes me think that's my, uh, look, looks like my brother's identical twin. Nice. So funny. <laughs> anyway, what else have we got to talk about? We have got. Um, hey, we've got to give a shout out to the boys because Craig Morris, Ben Nurse and Matt River last weekend went all the way to the North Norfolk coast. Yeah, they did. And recovered not just a little bit of rope, but 120 kilo of rope. Uh, there's a, um, what do you call it? A net. Yeah, it had all become entangled well. in the um, wooden groins on the beach. So obviously it's a bit of a hazard for people. It's a hazard for other wildlife, yeah. seals. So they did their bit in uh, recovering. Oh, say. Yeah, really good. Because otherwise some. it would just stay there or release itself and then go back into the sea to cause more problems. Craig went and cut his hand, as you do mm. when you've got numb hands and you're trying to cut through rope and whatever. Yeah. Because um, yeah. that's uh, blooming cold. You know, yeah. but yeah, well done to them for doing that and uh, getting that sorted out. I've got to ask, right? Because um, where was it? Sharon, wasn't it? No, West Brunton. Uh, Brunton, yeah. And the the crab and, and fishing community is not particularly big up there. Well, the, yeah, no, it is quite big. You think yeah, but there's not that many. But somebody must have known. Somebody must own that. And didn't they want that back? You get 120 kilo rope. That's a lot of rope. I think it shows that they um, are earning enough money that they can go and buy a new net. And That's not right. No, it's no, not. No, that, that's not right because, you know, are we meant to have a little bit of a conscience with all this and a bit of, you know, ethical about this? You know, come on, fishermen up there. 
Yeah, it's no worse than... Um, Why did it rubbish. take about three volunteers, nothing to do with the fishing industry, mm. not even local to that area, had to drive all the way out there? And, you know, fair play to them that they'd done that, but out of their back pocket... Yeah, that's their time. ...sorted that out when somebody, somebody along that fishing front should, mm. you know, owns that bit of rope. Yeah. Well, if anybody's got any comments, then point them our way because it'd be Maybe interesting it's a bit to controversial, know but do you know, what I mean? <laughs> you know if i if i'd lost a load of rope like that and i know how much good rope costs that's not cheap you're gonna want that back yeah yeah and it's a bit like um the neptune army of rubbish cleaners down in pembrokeshire they're yeah. recovering big lobster pots and they're worth money they're, they are yeah so i don't get it so i think well you should really have that back on two points. One, for, you know, on an ethical and conscious reason, and mm. two, for the sheer cost. Yeah. yeah. But there you go. Anyway, but at least it's good. That, let us know, but well done to the There's good people. And then you. we have another um, acquaintance to the podcast, uh, Dave Mason, who we've met on a dive trip at Lundy. Cave crawler, and he's good, good no, old he's friend, wrong. Roger, Roger. Cabin Boy. <laughs> Yeah, so obviously we've known them from their previous uh, days diving, and he follows the podcast, which is great. Yeah. What are you laughing at? <laughs> no, I just I think poor old Roger, he'll never be allowed to think. Uh, no, and then we let met that, them. Let at him the go- have that go. No, no. And then we met them at the Go Diving Show, which was lovely. So we had a selfie with them. We try walking away, but they caught us every time, didn't oh, they? You're so rude. <laughs> 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 but anyway, so we said we'd give him a shout out because he's been <laughs> he's been down at Project Seagrass. How will you behave? <laughs> so... In their high vis. Yes, so he it was a land based activity. Um, I think they cleared some of the uh, units where they've got seagrass um, maturing. I was just really pleased they all wore high vis because I couldn't see him in the photos. <laughs> Health and safety, health and safety. Oh, absolutely, health and safety all the yeah. time. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we said we'd give him a shout out and, uh, yeah, do have a look at Project Seagrass as well. Yeah, yeah, all good stuff. And we need our seagrass because it takes all that uh, uh, carbon monoxide out of the water. It does, yeah. It stores it all. Car- yeah. Carbon dioxide, not carbon dioxide. Carbon oh, dear. Get, get my monoxides and dioxides confused. <laughs> yes. Two different things. Right, next. It's early. <laughs> I know we've lost an hour in the UK as well. It's I know. Summertime and yeah, so it's all throwing us all out. So. Yeah. Okay, so next on the list Dan. was Dan. So Dan are um worldwide. Uh, you'll recognize their name if you are a diver, but they've just brought out a helpful checklist for people going on a diving holiday abroad. Yeah. Um but basically, it's a checklist to tick off what you need for diving abroad. Yeah, I did reshare it on um, on our LinkedIn, where is where I saw it. Um, but a really good post. Um, and also, um, oh, there was a really good post. And I did also share it at the same time on LinkedIn. And it was about the um, why gardens, how you should leave some gardens going rewild rewilding on mm-hmm. the rewilding thing go and look at that as well really interesting about increasing your insect as well in your garden but dan yeah really good checklist yeah. um thanks for doing that and putting that out there really yeah and i think it's always a good idea to maybe have a checklist when you go diving so you don't forget anything i admit i've got one well they are and there's you know i remember jill Hyneth, she she mm-hmm. mentioned one uh, about having a checklist there's you know you, you don't need um you don't really need you know so much to have um a company or a, a certain you know famous instruct uh, uh diver tell you you know what you need as so much is the fact is that you you know you put down there all the things you'd normally go dive in and and then check them off Make yeah. sure you've got them. And it's handy because, you know, you wouldn't want to get in your car and get halfway down the road uh, and then find out you haven't got your dry suit with you. No, exactly. So you wouldn't want to do that, would you? No, what nut does that? <laughs> so it's a bit like a shopping list, basically. Um, it is, yeah. Yeah, so. yeah. But there's loads of stuff online. You know, just, just Google it. Um, go on to 
Instagram, Facebook, you know, there's, you know, there's loads of checklists out there diving, for, but uh, there's a really good one that Dan put together. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so trip, have a look at that. Either go to LinkedIn or it'll be on their website as well. Yeah. Um, then we just want to mention our website. It's been updated again. So we've got our full face mask um, information on there and the package yeah. that you can purchase. Yeah. That will... And that is a special package, I have to say, because it's got everything on there that you need, like like what we've got yes. to get started, where if you go elsewhere, you'll have to buy all them bits and pieces individually. Yeah. Yeah, so we've made it. That is all we've brought them all together. So you can say, right, that's that. I'll have that lot. And that gets me started. Yeah. So if you've watched our um, social media, you'll know we are now qualified full face mask divers in our Neptune threes. And what you see us wearing are masks, the connectors for the hoses, uh, the comms kit, the rucksack is all within that package. We're so in the pool this coming Wednesday, aren't we? Doing some practicing with some skill checks and what happened. And you. just yeah, hoods we were gonna look at as well. Yeah. And get some more footage. Um so it'd be nice to get back in the water. Yeah. And then uh, mine should hopefully be going in be customized. Yes. Yeah. And I've just recently what put my mounted my GoPro um on top of the m- mask so that will yeah. be interesting to try out uh, craig needs to come back to me about getting some torches mounted yes so look like proper borg <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you don't know what borg is google borg star trek borg yeah so google google that and uh <laughs> yeah so but yeah we're looking forward to getting back in the pool um what else we've got in the week i've got my first do I need two torches do i need two torches on the side of my head no about balance but do they but will they look cool <laughs> yes they will <laughs> yes uh, yeah watch this space <laughs> yeah and then i think sunday uh, in a week's time i'm doing my first aid course in preparation for my rescue course yeah so i'll be Great course. really love doing the rescue course yeah so. um, if you are if you're kind of new and you've done your, you know, you're working your way through, you you know, done maybe say 30, 40, 50 dives. Um, great. You know, and you're thinking about what's next. You've done, you maybe you've done your advanced. Um, I'm trying to think what it is on the uh, comparison as BZAC, but basically you kind of are up to sort of like 25 to 30 meters now uh, of where you're certified. All right think about it think about doing the rescue course it kind of is that first course of where you now switch over to thinking about not so much just yourself in the water but mm. thinking about other people yeah you know, yeah and and it kind of is that change of thought but before you go down that route speak to your instructor speak to your dive center speak to your instructor and say hey think about doing this uh and I can't remember what it is on for BZAC, but it's very similar rescue course. It's all about this. They're all very similar. SSI um, and Dive Raid do the same thing. Um, whoever you agency you're with, speak to whoever your main instructor is and say, hey, think about doing this. Am I ready? Do you think I'm ready to now do this next bit? Because there is quite a bit involved. Yeah, you know, yeah. There's quite a bit involved, but there's a lot of life skills in there as well. So it's not just about because you're going to be learning about, you know, uh, first aid. There's there, there'll be that to it. You know, what do you do? You know, you could in someone could be a new diver and their buddy is ill. Well, yeah. You know, you, what are you going to do? So, yeah. so uh, it is a life skill, and you you know that means is. that you can then even if you saw somebody topple over in the street you've then got a bit of first aid knowledge that you can help so it's not yeah. just you know based around the diving arena you know first aid should, is you know useful. today in today's society we should learn some basic first first aid yeah. because as you said you could be on the bus on your way to work and somebody comes ill mm-hmm. well you know that could be 10 minutes away for an ambulance yeah. to yeah. arrive and if you how handy would it be if you mm-hmm some basic skills and the main thing is is that you do the best you can that's right yeah. you're not all cut out to be doctors and ambulance and paramedics but if you've got some basic skills behind you which you've learned you can potentially save somebody's life 
by doing the best you possibly can yeah yeah so so that's coming up um and yeah just you know have a look and see what course is available i'm doing a photography course in another month yeah well so that's just in the pool but it's just something else to you know add another skill yeah and widen some knowledge yeah i'm not doing anything now till um uh, i'll be diving but i'm not doing anything on the way courses go not until no, no, uh, honey to. is um because my focus now is helping the honey meister get through uh her open water in um first weekend in june all being well so uh, she had another lesson um in the pool this week with polly she and that went well. really well yeah. yeah yeah really well in fact um i look at her and i think do you know what you're doing that much easier and more relaxed than what i was in the pool and i'm not just saying that that is absolutely true um and she and she did uh module two uh exam got 10 out of 10 uh, mm. and she did that herself um so yeah be sorting out some fins and mask um for her um in the next sort of couple of weeks and then really um after because we won't be in the pool this week uh but there will then for the following week because she's now done module five um of the paddy book in the pool she'll be i'll be getting sort of getting that f- um about practicing really and then yes yeah get those skills nice. nailed and um, yeah and then yeah hopefully we'll get in the river just for a, a paddle about just to get used to yeah about um, may time i think it'd be time yeah. to jump in because i wanted to go uh, you know and you really found that helpful yeah, didn't you? And yeah. if you're doing the open water um you've got your open water certificate coming up in your year in the uk this is something to consider um and obviously your health and safety always comes first um you know and we found a a part of the river that was reasonably shallow and as easy to accessible not particularly strong flows it was a safe place to do it um but we found and you found it helpful um, yeah i did because but put, put your fins on wetsuit mask even wearing a hood for the first time visibility wasn't a torch you, out and, yeah, you know have and a just little... poke around it yeah. can't you yeah it um, just gets you used to being in not lovely crystal clear pool warm water you are actually within the elements yeah i've seen students um go from the pool uh, where it's all lovely and clear and warm and then they go to somewhere like Gildy or Stony Cove and then they, they, they're met with this <gasps> yeah <laughs> and and the reality hits because they're like oh, oh. And, and it is a quite a transition mm. you know, especially especially for kids as he, you know but adults as well yeah um, there's nothing that quite prepares you for the, the difference to be first to... dive is the worst is sometimes mm. the worst for them you know yeah. and when she got that first one out of the way. So I'm hoping that we do the same. So we'll get honey, go get in the, the river with us. Mm. You know, that will help bridge that gap between pool. Yeah. And I, 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 I think it helped no end for me because it just gets you used to what jumping in yeah. the, the water, a river, be it, or a lake, you know, actually means. Obviously, if you're a open water swimmer, then that's, that's cool. You're used to the... Yeah. If I can get her to, you know, she'll be 13 then. If I can get her to the stage um, of her open water certificate in June, where it's basically a tick box exercise, you know, because she's done skills, she's done practice, and she's been in the water and enjoyed mm. it, then great. Yeah, yeah. And then it, then from there on, it's just building experience in the water. Yes, yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, so look, watch Thank the you. journey unfold. So let's say. Yeah, I'm not putting, um, I think I'm sure I've mentioned before, but I'm not putting any pictures up or anything like that. So no, you know, no. she's she's not keen on that and that's her choice and, you know, she doesn't need the pressure. So, um, but I'm happy to share about it as we... Yeah, as we... well, it's an experience for Honey as well as it's an experience for you seeing your daughter go through yeah, um, it'd be amazing. quite an event. Yeah. It will be. Yeah, it'd be amazing. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so... Uh, what else have we got? Not at 90. So not at 90, our lovely friends um, near uh, on the A14 at Wellingborough, um, they have sent us a load of these really posh uh, black uh, slap straps. What's a, a slap strap? <laughs> a slap strap is, you see, it, it kind of goes on the back of your 
strap on your half mask and it just makes it a little bit easier to put it on and off and particularly for girls if you're not wearing a hood stops your hair getting in a bit of a tangle in your straps yeah and um so you know um a little bit of padding as well you know they're very nice and soft nice bit of design work and what have you on uh, on there as well with not uh not really cool um logo logo uh what's that genesis almost and it's like the genesis yeah that's not on there it's just the the writing but it's beyond technical so you'll be recognized if you wear this in a um at a dive site yeah definitely and it stops your uh, straps on your mask getting in a uh, you know a twizzle so it's just a uh, looks good does your mask get in a twizzle <laughs> i get a twizzle but yeah <laughs> especially if you're wearing a snorkel <laughs> <laughs> Oh yes. yes. Oh yes. One there was one <laughs> dive when Gemma came up and she thought she'd broke her neck. <laughs> yeah. no. well, somehow my snorkel had got um tangled in one of my hoses. And I was thinking, well, why can't I move my head? Yeah, especially <laughs> snorkel stuck. Because <laughs> you need them snorkels at Stony Cove. Anyway, we need to be careful what we say about snorkels and masks. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I, I've got my my own th- views on snorkels, uh, you know. Yes, and uh... in Inland Lake. <laughs> but anyway, oh, you... always need it. But hey, want... teaching standards, teaching standards, That's teaching the... standards and paddies, the paddy That's teaching good. way. Yes, but if you don't want your your straps in a twizzle, have a look at these slap straps. So we're going to do a little bit of a giveaway, all right? Because they are pretty cool, and mm. um, it'd be really cool to see. Uh, some of you lovely listeners out there uh, wearing these really posh uh, slap straps. Um, so we're going to do a bit of a giveaway. All right. So there's two. Okay. You can come find us w- when we're diving. Come find, we've got a posh new flag um, with the NARC logo on as well. It's yeah. really easy to spot. It's all color and really cool. Um, it replaces the one that we did have uh, with our old logo. Uh, come find us and uh, first five people we will give you a slap strap but you yeah. must wear it though you know we don't see it discarded on the ground because that's just waste yeah and the slap strap is really easy to fit it's velcro so you don't need to take your straps off your mask to install it it's just simply undo the velcro put your straps through and then seal it back up the first five people come find us on the, with the flag We'll um, we'll give you one of them uh, slap straps. Uh, take your photo, and then you'll be on our social media. All right, yeah. okay. So that's the first giveaway. Is when you see us at diving. What's the we'll, so the second one is um, you don't need to obviously physically see us, but you do need to go to the Nart Ninety Facebook page or LinkedIn page and like it. Yeah. Take a screenshot. Then you need to head over to our YouTube channel and subscribe. Yep. Take a screenshot and then go to our website and subscribe to our uh, email distribution list. And yep. then that's um, our way of knowing that you've we can tie it all up and then we'll uh, select some lucky winners. Yeah, uh, well, you know, basically do that and we'll send them out to you. So, yep. uh, um, yeah, that'd be really cool. So, uh, yes, it helps us. We'll help you and you get to have one of these really posy slap straps. Yeah, and if you want to look at them in greater detail, they are on the Narked at 90 website. Yeah, yeah, I'll be putting one on mine. Um, yes. I'll see, um, if, I'll see if the honey, well, honey hasn't got a mask yet, but once she get one, I'll see whether she wants to put one Yeah, on. we'll wear our half masks in the pool on Wednesday, so we'll um, take some pictures and plug those on social media as well. Yeah, yeah, and so that, thank you very much to Narked at 90 uh, for, you know, supporting us with them. Yeah. And thanks for the sweeties in the box as well. <gasps> sweets? Yeah. You didn't tell me about sweets. Haribo sweets. <laughs> How can the post goes to you and you get sweets? <laughs> yes. I, I'm on a diet, so I can't have sweets. No, don't talk about sweets. No. <laughs> anyway, so there's been quite a bit in this one. So uh, the main thing is Mary Rose experience. You need to go to there. Go to maryrose.org. Um, and look at their website, book your tickets, um, half, is it, no, full term, got holiday coming up, Easter break coming up very soon. Yeah, we've got Easter. Good time to get to the Mary Rose. If you haven't been, 
I, you know, and there's so much in Portsmouth uh, and the surrounding area. Halen Island is, a, you know, for even non-divers. Yeah. You yeah. know, when that tide go out, it's a massive beach and really good for the hydrofoil boats. If you watch, look at them. Um, Windsurfing, kite wind, surfing. There's so much to do down that area. Um, if you're thinking about getting a few days and stay down there, if the weather, you know, if even the weather's not particularly great, there's so much to do. Yeah. Um, but do get your tickets to the Mary Rose uh, experience. I can't say it enough. Yeah, and um, if you if you do go, let us know and uh, tell us what you think. But yeah, um, yeah that'd be really we'll, cool. We're looking forward to um, our uh, premiere of it on Thursday. Yes, yeah, that's going to be awesome. Never been to a, a premiere. No, so uh, I look forward to that. Little uh, road trip. Look forward to meeting some of the people who have been involved in it. That's going to be quite an experience. Mm. Um, and here and there, you know, it's going to be quite a you know night for them. Yes, really. yeah. Yeah, it gets everybody together that's been involved in the Mary Rose uh, raising. And, and obviously... Hopefully we'll get a few discussions with some of them and get a few interviews and uh, mm. perhaps we can uh, get them out to you or be, there'll be some stuff on YouTube anyway. Yeah. About yeah. that. Yeah, uh, so lots coming up. We probably just mention as well, um, just changing the subject very quickly. We had a great interview with Patrick Widman. We did Friday on Friday. Night. Yeah. Uh, so Patrick, we met personally at the Go Diving show. He was a speaker there. Um, he's a big time. Well, he's an explorer. Um, that's yeah. kind of what um, he'd probably like to be known. But he's a, a, an amazing diver, cave explorer. And uh, yeah, he came on and we had just an amazing chat with him, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, went over time, um, you know, and uh, there, there's a lot, he, you know, he he talks about, you know, about his, how he got started and what yeah. happened, um, the downside of social media, uh, mentioned we talked about that for a little bit, uh, the diving that he does, some exploring he's done. Yeah, incredible. Yeah, you know, and his presence in the water, and he talks about that, uh, it, absolutely brilliant and um, you know we look forward to sharing that with you uh, probably in the next sort of couple of weeks really I think, yeah it might be the ne next episode to be honest um, yeah so we've get that out and uh, yeah have look a little, have a look on their website pro tech dive centers yeah Patrick's on social media Instagram and Facebook but yeah head over to their website and have a look and uh, look Patrick up um, he's in yeah uh, he's only a youngster and uh, it's, what he's done is just yeah pretty amazing and we are when we had a short interview with him at the go diving show uh yeah, it was on our previous one of our previous episodes but actually we did a recording and it's actually on our youtube as well so mm. you can actually go to the youtube um it is in the stadium you know so the, the sound is not massively brilliant but, no, you know, but he gave us an update didn't he on on what he'd uh been up what to and basically who he was. So if you want to see Patrick in person before the podcast episode, go to our YouTube channel, subscribe and uh, have a watch. Yeah, yeah, it's all there. Right. Should we get these? Um, should we get this on to this episode? Yeah. So um, this episode is with Alex Hildred and uh, she tells us all about her experience diving on the Mary Rose and it's raising and it's maintenance and ongoing maintenance. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Excellent. Right. We'll look forward to seeing her on on Thursday. Yeah. And we'll uh, catch you next week. Yeah. Thanks for downloading this episode. And uh, don't forget to leave us a review. Um, a five star review on iTunes helps us get found and helps your buddy finds us as well. Yeah. Tell your diving friends. Tell them about the podcast as well. Yeah. Okay, Oaks. Right. Enjoy your Sunday or whenever you listen to this and we'll speak to you all soon. Yeah. Bye, everyone. And thanks for listening. That's awesome. And we are super pleased to have you on uh, to talk to us about all this. And it's also your 40th anniversary of, you know, of raising it up from the water. And that seems like, well, yesterday. It's like yesterday, yeah. I know. Um, so <laughs> well... <laughs> tell us about it. Okay, well, we're planning, it's October the 11th, and uh, that's when the Marys came up 40 years ago this October. So yep. we're planning a three-day event in Portsmouth. Every five years, we invite uh, all of the divers we've got current names for. And that's, of course, difficult now with GDPR. It's not as easy as it used to be. Yeah. And we invite them back to a series of lectures, sometimes about what they've done since leaving the Mary Rose, and obviously to keep 
them in touch with what's happening and they see the museum, uh, etc. So this year we're doing it for slightly longer than that and there are going to be a whole load of lectures and visits to places hopefully like the Historical Diving Museum in Gosport and maybe even out to the site of the Mary Rose depending on, on what people want. Yeah. So that's what's happening in October. But on the back of that we're installing in the museum which is what I've been feeding into over the past, well, since, since Mary Rose came ashore, really, 1984, the first museum was open. Um, we're doing a big thing on the raising of the Mary Rose. So that will be a 4D cinema experience, trying oh, wow. to make people uh, experience what it was like to be on the Mary Rose during the last stages of the excavation, the tunneling under the ship and the lifting of the ship. So that's wow. uh, lots of augmented reality, lots of use of, of uh, the video that was undertaken during the um, raising of the Mary Rose that we had chronicle uh, with us for four programs worth so we've got a lot of unseen footage of that which is going to be hopefully uh, used for films as well as perhaps feed into this 4d experience yeah. so quite a lot happening really that's wow. amazing the uh, i've been to the museum and i took my children there uh, just before the first lockdown and uh, we had an amazing time and uh, for anyone who's listening you know uh, it's definitely worth the, the trip. Um, you know, it's really interesting. You can, you, you get that, you know, the sound effects and seeing the, the actual ship is just amazing how it's, um, how it's been, uh, put, you know, put there and then positioned with the lighting and the sound effects. And you, you've got two stories, how you can see it. And it's just absolutely uh, amazing to, to see. And it's such a big part of our, history you know going back to henry the eighth you know as his flagship and all that but let's go back a bit uh not quite as far as henry the eighth let's go back to the late 70s when you first put the project you were thinking about putting this project together um because okay we right ra you raised it in 1982 but mm. the project much like started much before that it really started in um, in the mid 60s with a local uh, person who was a scuba diver, Bizak club diver, South Sea Branch, um, who was a historian and he wanted a project to look for historic wrecks within the Solent and the Mary Rose was obviously the sort of the pride and joy. There, there are quite a number within the Solent, but he, he set his sights on the Mary Rose. And so a group of volunteer divers, 10 or 20 at the most, augmented by whoever they could get really. So it was the South Sea Sub Aqua Club, some people from Portsmouth, Bezac, uh, at the Portsmouth South Sea Sub Aqua Club, but also Southampton. Yeah. And um, yeah. things like Royal Engineers and Firemen, people with holiday time would come and work with Alex McKee on weekends and occasionally a couple of weeks in the summer to basically scour the seabed, but just put people in, in the water and, and look at various features and see what, whether there was anything underwater and they basically we've got a rough idea that it was somewhere off South Sea Castle because mm -hmm. there's an ancient an engraving which shows the sinking of the Mary Rose so by looking at that taking that as a sort of a center point for a search certain areas were, were searched and, and um, very very little found to begin with but um, in in the 60s uh, a guy called Doc, Doc Edgerton or Harold Edgerton from MIT was coming over to Tobermory to look for the Tobermory Spanish Galleon using his sub bottom profiler. And um, Alex McKee, who had then been joined by Margaret Rule as their conservator, and she was just learning to dive at the time, uh, convinced uh, Doc Edgerton to come and, and go over the area that they thought might be you know, where the Mary Rose would most likely lie. And they found an anomaly. And within a couple of years after that, an iron gun was found. And then three years later, the, the site itself was found. So, you know, it was amazing. Timbers, timbers so what were found was in 1971. And by the end of the day, four timbers had become a run of 20 timbers or 30 timbers. And it was the side of a ship that was very old. And the gun had been found uh, several years earlier was of the type that could only be Tudor. So basically wow. yeah. the Mary Rose had been found. So what sort of depth um, was the wreck lying at? 12 metres, a really good depth for archaeological work, 12 metres to the seabed. And then obviously when we got further down and mm. in tunnelling under the ship, which had to happen for the lifting to, to, to put the wires through the ship, that was a 20 metre diving table. And that everything changed when, when that happened. So that's a completely different sort of part of the excavation, if you like. But yeah. most of it was done entirely on scuba until... Again, in late 1980, 81, when the ship began to be dismantled in order to, to prepare for the lift, some of the team went away to, to various places and did uh, surface supply diving, it did part one, HSC part one, so that they mm. could um, safely wear helmets and do the, the heavy lifting that was required 
to get some of the big guns out and to tunnel under the ship in particular. So at some stages there were two teams working and then in some on surface supply and the bulk of us on scuba still, the archeologists, most of the archeologists on scuba, although a number of, their, of them went on to the team and learned uh, surface supply. Uh, yeah. And then we were augmented in 82 by a team of Royal Engineers as well. So it was quite a busy mm-hmm. thing. And we were, we were on a, a diving support vessel, which was moored over the site for the entire diving season, which could be from February until December, if we were lucky with the weather. Um, and then we'd stay, the full-time team and the archeological team would be on board for two days and one night. And then you'd have a day off to go in the office and sort of clear all, you know, clear all the nitrogen out of your system. Yeah. So um, the bulk was done on scuba. So we've got 500 scuba divers helped it happen, you know? Wow. And that is digging the ship out with their bare hands, getting the debris away in, in airlift. So it was a huge, huge organization, really. Yeah. I mean, even the grid, the whole area above the site had a grid, not, not necessarily for survey, but so that you could hang off it. So you didn't need to touch the, the mm-hmm. seabed because once you did, it was like flower, the visibility disappeared. So the engineering aspect is something that's never been told. You know, to build a 40 meter long, 15 meter wide grid, it's divided into three meter squares that coincide with the natural um, wooden divisions of the ship. So you know you were working on, on you know, in the upper deck in bay three of the ship itself. Mm. And then above that, you had this grid. Those are sort of the untold stories the, and the complexity of getting 40 divers a day in the water safely in the right place on the right tide to work at uh, the right number of minutes all on on scuba without computers was, was amazing um, yeah it is yeah we uh, were saying uh, earlier weren't we how different diving would have been back 40 years ago to how uh, it is now we didn't have dry suits until 1981 you know it was a, a dry suit we, and then we looked at our dive times and suddenly instead of having to come up in because the best tide was the easterly tide which you had 96 minutes um you'd get cold when it was you know yeah. early in the, in, the, in the spring if you like and our dive times just went through the roof then you know we were, we were all pretty good on on using air unless you yeah. were working really hard um but it was the fact you were cold it sometimes stopped mm-hmm. you and the dry suit was just an absolute re- revelation <laughs> <laughs> i just imagine what that must have been like when you know having the dry suit uh, after all that time in cold water you know, um, that's that's a challenge in itself, isn't it? Is the health mm-hmm. and safety point, but also there's that, you know, concentration of you know what you're doing and being freezing cold. That's a that's a big ask, especially if you're just sitting there drawing. I mean, airlifting is something. At least you're using your hands and and uh, and moving a bit. But you know, if you're sitting on a grid or li- or dangling from the top of a grid, uh, putting your legs around it, your legs get cold and start yeah. shaking. And you start shaking. So. Yeah, dry suits were great, but all so, sorts of changes in technology. And then the yeah. HSC came in and I think changed so a little bit. So was you there. like um, developing technology and things as you went to, to help? Certainly uh, through the excavation, yes. So um, basically before the Mary Rose airlifts had been used in loads of things, especially civil engineering, but they were quite yeah. heavy and made to be negatively buoyant to stay on the seabed. And they were big steel things that were hard to move around. Yet we were trying to hold them above the sediments and just instead of using them to dig with, with the exception of perhaps the tunneling under the ship, we were just using them to take away the debris because we were carefully exposing things like wicker baskets where you can't have this huge monstrous airlift when you're trying to get delicately excavate a wicker basket or Mm. human remains or a leather jerkin or shoe. So we made them neutrally buoyant, which was great. And so that you could actually just move your hand over the the mouthpiece, they were they were um, four inch internal diameter and then go up or go down or whatever. So you were almost using them as a buoyancy compensator as, w- as well yeah. as uh, an excavation tool. And they were wonderful. You could almost dance with them. You know, the only problem was we, we had 11 on each side of the shipwreck and inevitably they got tangled up. And that was, a, you know, in, oh, the, you know, in mid water, you're trying to untangle an, an airline. <laughs> But again, oh. that's that's due to the size of the project. So big projects that have happened recently, like the Invincible, you know, they're two, three, four airlifts maximum, maybe even two. Yeah. And we had eleven that you could you could have eleven people airlifting at once if you wanted to. Now that rarely happens, but that they were stationed along the length of the hull so that you could have access to wherever you wanted to with it. And eleven on the port side because the tides went east west and the ship was north south. So, uh, yeah, it was big engineering. Uh, you know operation really 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he was in charge of all the divers and he was in charge of uh, making sure, you know, everyone was uh, doing what they should be and things like that. Well, Margaret Rule was the archaeologist in charge of the entire archaeological program, and she had two deputies, one who was principally considered with archaeology and the yeah. other who dive safety, and he managed all the dive safety. That was Jonathan Adams, who's now professor of archaeology at Southampton and is just, you know, he's been doing this huge project in the in the Black Sea at finding the earliest intact shipwreck at two miles, you know, deep and stuff. Yeah. But um, yeah, Goodness. so he, he set in place the, um, the dive, uh, diving supervisors wrote it so they were always there was always a chief diver on board at any time sometimes two and they would with the archaeologist because we would have to work out where we wanted certain people to work at certain times of the tide depending on because you want to put people if you're only having people for two weeks you don't want them to have to learn uh the archaeology in a new place all the time you want to keep mm -hmm. them in the same place you're so right. to do that that place change accessibility to that changes with the tides and it changes every day too because it's always you know slightly later yeah so um it was the archaeologist with it within certain trenches we divided the site into trenches who worked out the dive rota and then that was managed by the dive safety officer who logged people in and out of the water and and uh, made sure that if they didn't come up, we had a series of bells on the ladder uh, to, to come up and people knew who was in the water. And then every time one of the full-time team went in or, or an archeologist, before they would go to their place of work, they'd be told to check on however many people were in the water closest to them, just as an extra safety thing. So Yeah, yeah. I think I've seen a video somewhere of um, divers using some kind of suction pipe Thing. Well, that would be the, an airlift. Yeah, it's basically yeah. a downpipe from a gutter, you know, the, you know, the vertical downpipes in plastic yeah. where you, you bring in compressed air to about uh, 30 centimeters above it. So it creates a, with an on off switch and it creates a vacuum right. and you can control that either by the gate valve, which opens and close it. Or, as I said, by opening or closing your hands over it. So you okay. get a really, really good thingy. But if you let it go absolutely wild, it will suck a hole into the seabed, even a four inch one will, or if you're stupid enough to get your demand valve too close to it, it'll suck your demand <laughs> valve out. And if you get it blocked with something, let's say it's a Tudor shoe, which would be an awful shame, it'll take you up to the surface really, really quickly in an emerge, you know, an uncontrolled ascent. So wow. you, know, you would actually let go of it and then go back to the to where the hose was attached to yeah. the, um, mm. the hose was attached to a bigger hose that went up to, to the ship and you go back to that and then pull down quietly and everybody on board the base uh, on board the vessel be looking at the airlift that had been up there with this the water spouting and then see see it being pulled down quietly and you'd sit at the bottom saying i hope they didn't realize it was me wow. <laughs> so it was really good that you had uh, the support from um like the Marines and the Navy, then they were wanting to get involved and help with the engineering. And yes, in 1982, I mean, we didn't have that many during the, the biggest excavation was basically 1979 to 1982. Before oh. that, when Alex McKee and the, the local sub aqua clubs had been working augmented by other people it had been short period shorter periods of time as i said a couple of weeks in the year or weekends but when when the mayor's trust was formed in 1979 we knew that it was a race against time because what we wanted to do is open the whole ship before that the ship had been found and basically timbers had been uh wor worked around the timbers to try and work out which way the ship was was mm -hmm. lying yeah. and then put trenches across the ship to understand the structure and we decided that if we ever wanted it up the best thing to do is to open the whole area, which is why we put a grid over it, and um, so that you could basically work from the grid. So, and, and to do to do that, you know, that's when we had a big change. But from that period on, we didn't have so many Royal Engineers until nineteen late nineteen eighty one and eighty two when they came to do very specific jobs, yeah, like yeah, dig yeah. the holes for the foot positions for the the um, platform that was lowered over the ship that eventually the wires from the ship were attached to. Um, and then the jacks on the legs jacked it up and moved it into a cradle. So, okay. so what was it like um, trying to get people involved? So back in those days, you know, uh, as a, we've got so today when we look at things today, we, we can look at so, putting things on social media. Yeah, yeah. We can uh, do all sorts of things really quickly to get support for a project. But back then how how did you go about then getting more support and was everybody really supportive or did they oh, say yeah. well you know it's an old ship that's long gone and we don't need to worry about that did you know was 
how, how, was, how did that come about? Well, the British Sabaco Club were very, very um, supportive from from the start. So were the Sabaco Association. So we'd got we'd have uh, articles in Diver Magazine, um, and that obviously through the network of BZAC clubs, which even then was sort of there were quite a number of them, yeah. and we formed our own Mary Rose Special Branch. Uh, so for, for the divers yeah. from Mary Rose and local radio stations, but also you know any anybody who worked for the Mary Rose Trust full time at that time was expected to spread the word so you do it mm -hmm. wherever you wherever you could and I mean, yeah. they advertisements in newspapers for anybody who had a couple of weeks to spare and was a diver um ideally with you know a certain number of dives and i think it was said you had to have a, over a 10 mil wetsuit to begin with <laughs> 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 wouldn't be allowed unless you'd done like 10 dives and wow. had a and had a or eight mil maybe it was eight mil wetsuit yeah but. yeah so did you actively go and dive you know, on a, a regular basis while all the excavation work was being done and? Um, what, elsewhere? Or, uh, I mean... No, on I, Mary Rose. Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I was part of the team that was on two days on, one day off. Yeah. So, between yeah. 79 and 82, um, that's basically what I did. 82 changed a bit and actually it was 24 hours on, 24 hours off, except for what we were doing as the archaeological team was emptying the archaeology that was left on the west side of the site which could only be done on a westerly tide run so mm -hmm. we just came the tide runs and over the couple of months we were there that inevitably meant some at night so you might come on at you know 12 o'clock at night to dive at two in the morning and then go off at six in the morning and then the next team would come on to do, to do it and you'd do that round the clock so in 1982 that that was completely different for all of us you had people the salvage and recovery team with with um, kirby morgan's uh water jetting and airlifting making tunnels under the ship to drill through it and us inside madly trying to finish the last of the the archaeology on the western side even if it it, it was at night so wow. for that we had a chandelier because we found this at the 11th hour we'd, we'd brought up this whole brick structure that had collapsed we thought oh yeah that's the galley of the ship and then in i think it was just late as middle of may this entire brick wall became exposed and we thought oh my god we've got a complete oh, pair to the galley on the other side of the ship and that's like two thousand bricks you know it's a lot to on a ship there. yeah so there were four thousand in total and 700 logs that you know the mary what was the brick wall doing? well it's it's basically a big auger it's like a, a oh. pink oven below with a big uh round area that was beautifully made with the bricks going in, in a circle around it uh, to take a huge cauldron of brass that would cook the food for the 500 men. So wow. with the ability to, to, to dangle roast um, a venison joint or a joint in front of the, the firebox that was in an arch underneath mm -hmm. um, or baked bread. Or so, I mean, it's a really very, very useful yeah. thing to think that, oh my goodness, you've got these whole thing to deconstruct and it's complete. So you have to survey it in, in position and you're doing it at night or part of it was being done at night because that was, uh, you know, it would so be. Why, why was you working 24 seven? Because- To get it the, done. The, yeah, but the, what was the deadline? Why, why was there a deadline? Because it, let's face it, it'd been under the water, you know, for like hundreds <laughs> yeah. of years. But we'd so, exposed the whole thing. You see, we by that stage, we'd emptied everything but the really solid bits. There were certain certain bits that had like uh, piles of iron shot that corroded together. And so they were big lumps that had to be taken out. So and it now exposed to the salt water. water. In salt water, that it just goes like concrete. So yeah. you would try taking them up in as big a lump as possible, then radiograph them and look at how they were lying before. Uh, exposing them by, by using a chisel and a hammer or usually it was just a hammer banging it up to set a motion going that would shake it apart rather than than sharp tools but um yeah so we were working because of, of that month the a lot of the westerly tides which we needed to take the debris away from the site because you don't want to infill the areas oh, uh, so, yeah. if we were working in uh, the Holden Orlap, which is on the west, you'd want a yeah. westerly tide run to take it out of the site, not to fill in the main deck and the upper deck on the other side. So, it, I mean, it was complex, but it was yeah most fun of our lives. You know? But I guess, yeah. I guess, um, if I've taken the, the sand and the debris out, the chances are I can take artifacts out with it as well. Oh, so yeah, I see your point. So, yes, yeah, so you've been very careful, but as a result of that, actually, when the navy was going to, um, they, they were thinking of dredging the existing channel into the harbour for the two big carriers, the Queen Elizabeth and the, yeah. uh, and the Prince of Wales. And it, the area that they 
we're doing widening it to is going to just clip part of our historic rec circle so the mm. mary rose is, the seabed is actually protected around it and only we can work it because we've rented the the um seabed from the crown estates commission well we got we said well they said oh, whoa, the whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> hold on hold on <laughs> you rented the seabed even before the Mary Rose was found, when this W feature was picked up by um, Sub Bottom Profiler and yeah. the gun had been found, uh, before the Mary Rose Trust was formed, a committee was formed to, in 1967 to acquire that area from the Crown. So we still pay an annual fee. It's like if you, if you have a mooring yeah, uh, yeah. now, you rent the, that bit of That's seat amazing. from the Crown Estate. <laughs> But it was absolutely fantastic because it gives us exclusivity to that site. Yeah. Whereas yeah. on many other sites, so for, for example, um, recently on the Colossus in Scilly, you could have two teams working on it because even though one might have been working for, for 40 years on it, having worked mm -hmm. on the first Colossus excavation, because they put in very good project designs and they were accepted by Historic England, English Heritage in order to do that. Well, that isn't the case with us because we still rent the site from the Crown Estate. So, and at the time that that, that was done, there wasn't a protection of Rex Act. So it was the only way of protecting the site from right, anybody right. else who might want to see, oh, what's that boat doing over there? You know, maybe we should go and have a look. So, and that was the only way of doing it was, was to do it that way. And we still use that. And what it means is that no matter how good somebody else's project design is, you know, we've put all these years, millions of pounds into it. We're curating the collection. We will work with other people and we do work with other people, but it means that, you know, it's, it's working with us rather than instead of us. So yeah. it's a very, it was a really, really far-sighted move. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Um, you know, because that you're still renting that. So our <laughs> they give it to us, you? Uh, Yeah, but uh, <laughs> especially, yeah, you, you, you know, you're recovering part of the English heritage and culture. So um, oh, I lost my train. So I, 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 is excavation still ongoing? Well, actually, there's a vessel surveying. It's uh, I don't know whether it was yesterday. It had two days yesterday. Uh, sorry, Wednesday or today. Um, so I haven't checked to see whether that's happened. That's through Southampton University. And that is using multi beam. So regularly, various universities that we work with might test their equipment with new students mm -hmm. uh, and go out over the site because they know there's a big hole there with some features that, you know, they'll be able to see. And they say, you know, it's a monitoring thing for us, which is absolutely fantastic. But we're scheduled to dive on it on the... Uh, 12th and 13th this is a week, a week on two weeks today or something, uh, right. Thursday and Friday, um, because uh, that we've noticed that there's some erosion up on the northern part of the site where the anchor buoy is, which marks the historic wreck site. It's a big buoy that sort of says Mary Rose keep off type of thing. And uh, we got it exchanged in, in 2014 for a bigger buoy because we were, we have a data or we had a data logger on the seabed that was collecting all sorts of information and sending it to us. And in order to do that, you needed a bigger buoy, which meant a bigger chain. And in time, that's actually made quite a hole for itself in a very sensitive area where we still think there might be remains of the bow castle because if you've been, you said you've been to see the Mary Rose, you'll notice that there isn't a bow. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. when that broke off is still a mystery. How much is left is still a mystery. But when we were working in 2005 as a result of mitigation money by the MOD because they were going to put this channel in, we recovered the stem, the big timber that comes to form the, the bow that attaches to the um, keel and keelson of the ship and we found a lotus structure from the upper missing port side which had obviously fallen off to the port side and interestingly hadn't been picked up by any of the other surveys because the sogginess of the wood if you like is really similar to the to the silt itself yeah. um, but as, so so we live in hope that we might have part of the bow castle still there in bits we did pick up loads of wood in 2000 between 2003 and 2005 but there's still guns missing there's still quite a big portion of the assemblage that could be there or it could have been destroyed during the initial attempts to salvage a ship or it could be where john dean signed out his you know 13 inch mortar shells in 1840 and made big holes yeah. in other parts of the wreck that we can see but maybe they just put a bigger one in the bow and and you know completely destroyed it so there's still so many questions so that place being eroded by the chain obviously gives us cause for concern so that's why we're diving it's so, amazing to think yeah. that you know everybody assumes oh that's the mary rose up and that's yeah. the end of the story on the seabed but it it's continues and it's just oh it does but it's so expensive you can't do it. I mean, in order to, to do this, you know, this is very kindly uh, an award that was given to, um, to, to Dan Pascoe, who put, who put it forward. And um, 
and so we have to be very creative about how how we dive the site now which is why mm. we you know take the help of anybody who wishes to help us nearly and um and why it's so important to have good contacts with things like universities and yes uh, yeah. Yeah. And the navy i mean the navy have come and done regular surveys as well over this time so the navy are, are some of our biggest allies as well so are you saying this is could be a potential citizen science where people could contact you to say um you know we're, i'm a diver i'd like to get involved and help well, we could only do that if we, I mean, it's not just the, the divers, it's actually the cost of the boat and, and everything else. So that yeah. would be a difficult thing. And it would have to be part of a program that obviously we could justify archaeologically and the trust could justify our, our time to, yeah. to work on because we're a very small number of people here. And our biggest thing is actually keeping the objects that we've got in the right. You'll have noticed in the Mary Rose that there are two, these long galleries on either side of the ship, yeah. which contain thousands of objects recovered from the ship, positioned exactly exactly opposite where they were found in the ship well those are environmentally controlled and just mm -hmm. to keep the ship environmentally controlled and those huge 35 meter long galleries is a massive expense so under the whole museum in the bottom of the dry dock there is all of this piping and, and air ducts and electricity and electricity bills through the roof so to justify if we I mean I'd love to go and do a big excavation but where would we put this stuff how would we look after it how is that the best use of the few archaeologists time who are left so people can be involved but it would more likely have to be us deciding that we wanted to actively fundraise for a big project and get a team together and then ask people to join the team mm. that is such a big trade-off isn't it because mm. so on one hand you've got these items which are potentially there you know, you've got the bow uh, castle uh, which is potentially Possibly. still there but if you bring it up, you've got a plan for it and you've got the space and then the funding that's needed. Yeah, yeah. Or do you just, or do you just leave it there in the sand? Well, we recovered, day? we recovered the, we found structures. I said it was port side structure, but it was like 15 frames and in and out of hull planking. So it was quite a big amount. And we didn't, because we didn't expect to find so much of it, we didn't have permission to go underneath it and look at the underside of it. So we really carefully reburied it with a membrane and then loose sand and then um, uh, 80 tons of, of sand from sandbags that we put in, into it as well. 750 sandbags, 80 tons of loose sand and, and a membrane. And so we know exactly where that is. So that is something for future generations that, you know, if only they could go and look at the underside of it and see if it's eroded, it means it stood up for a while before it fell down. If it's absolutely clean, it means it came off perhaps at the time of sinking. So there's so many questions that could mm. be asked if we could do that, but you, you sort of need a millionaire and <laughs> or a couple of millionaires to come and want to do that. I think yeah. for us to do it now, it, it would be the wrong thing for us to, to spend our you know very meager resources because it's basically everything that we get from, from visitor uh yeah. visitors coming through the gate and as you know it's been part for, for many historic attractions mm. over the past couple of years yeah it must have been when you're actually doing the excavation and the investigation the atmosphere among the divers and the teams must have been incredible it was it it was and it was so much fun as well and we've just been we've got a legacy group of about 70 and one of the things we're trying to do this year is go through all the slides from 79 to 82 and whilst we did basic annotations of what it is it's all the people and it's what they were doing and you're just looking at people that are you know 40 years old and, and we get them all up on a screen together and share it and just have such a laugh and it's it's so good it's the only way to do it because you can't you know i can't remember all their names and there are only two of us here now who were who were part of the original diving team wow. so it's great to have these legacy things every couple of weeks and share again those those fun times by going through the documentation but it's important too because if we don't get it written down you know we could all be gaga in five years time and not remember who <laughs> it's true i have trouble remembering what i did last week so well, yeah. <laughs> get actually the longer the time framework the better your memory i can't remember what i ate this morning you know <laughs> <laughs> wow. uh, so, so in your younger days, um, obviously you started diving when you went to university. Yeah, I went yeah. to Sheffield, so Stony Cove, you know, that was where most Yay. of the training was. <laughs> We're there tomorrow. <laughs> Are you? <laughs> Still a great place, but um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So did you ever think that is the moment that you learned to scuba dive where that would take you? No, and I didn't think, I mean, it, I applied that entire season for 79, all for, for every single 
um, episode because it was divided depending on when the spring tides were there was usually a four or five day break where it just wasn't worth diving so there were a number of different sessions and I applied for every single one it wasn't till like the second to last one that there was room to you know because obviously people got there first and um, and that was in October we finished in December diving that year and when we came off the boat Margaret said do you, do you want to be a full-time member of staff and that was it and I haven't looked back since although I've done lots of projects in my holidays and taken some unpaid leave and I would never have thought you know I was going to do a PhD in physical anthropology at the University of Calgary the next year but you know, that <laughs> um, because the Mary Rose and I think people talk about the Mary Rose bug and I do think there is one and, and you know if you were to come to one of our reunions you'd see it you've got all these people acting like they're 20 again and having so much fun and, but uh, we, uh, there's there's a gravity to this because you know you know we've already talked about you know where were you when they wrote when they raised the mary rose yeah. um i know where i was Gemma know where she was and we kind of think wow you know this is going to be around for years to come uh you know future generations will see they'll research it they talk about it at school you know as part of our history uh and you've been part of that and you know you've always go you know that's always going to be part of your part of your life isn't it as part of your you know thing yeah yeah it's amazing right. thing to be part of it is it's amazing i mean absolutely i've been so lucky i mean I just can't yeah and so it's lucky it's really great to think that is not the end of the story where the Mary Rose is you know above the water but there is yeah. still yeah much more to find and yeah. locate yes and we're still I mean with 2003 and 2005 we did have some younger divers who um some of them were coming out on uh, next week after next so you know there is that transfer of information mm. and yeah. from one generation to another which is which is really good and um and so that and that's push this legacy thing too is to give the next generation as much of our knowledge as they can uh, as yeah. we can of the site and of what we thought we left behind in the important areas that that you know oh gosh if, we, if only we'd gone there we might have found this so i mean some of it might just be gut feelings but it's that sort of thing that you, you know you can't replace and weren't necessarily written down in the fantastic site books and dive records that we've got mm, so, yeah. you know, things we didn't do but want other people to do so the legacy and inspire you know the younger generation now although that was 40 years ago mary rose came up but to inspire people with that bug you yeah. know might lead to amazing things in the future yeah. yeah so have you are you still diving uh yeah yeah so i dived on the invincible two years ago and yeah. i mean not, not a lot has happened since since um the lockdown but um and then before that the rosevac on the goodwin sands um and as i say mary rose in two weeks time yeah yeah, yeah that's yeah. good so what level did you get to uh, yourself well for, for bizac it was advanced instructor and for a while uh, my husband who was who was then working on the mary rose as well um had a, had a diving school which he we taught both school, so i helped teach scuba so we taught scuba and he did some because he was on the dismantling then the salvage team he also did some come and try at surface supply stuff so that was in gosport so we did that for a couple of years so i was an advanced instructor instructor and then okay. when the hse got you know underwater archaeology became more involved in, in you know, health and safety various other things because we were all then definitely at work um i did a, a I went to fort william and did a part three so i got part three which is all you need for for the sort of work that i'm doing you know, yeah. and various other things i don't really need explosives and wow <laughs> other people can do that you know. yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> do you dive um like for pleasure recreationally rather than um, i used to a lot and we have um, a house in scotland so you know it's a beautiful place to dive and all my my four children dive so um yeah but it's sort of not so much <laughs> because it's so much of a job it, it's probably not as much as most people but we did with the diving school we went to Malta quite a lot for mm -hmm. um, and then had a project in, in Malta in the Grand Harbour in St Paul's Bay so I would say I, we did a lot of diving most of it you'd think you'd probably classify as work even though it was fun scuba diving teaching people to dive um, but it wouldn't be I, I've never been on a liverboard for just for a holiday or anything. No. I'd love to I'd love to <laughs> 
and I've uh, lived a boy next and it's waters. all been working. But, yeah. um, but, you know, if you love the work, where's yeah. the work? That's true. The work holiday boundary it sort of doesn't really exist. So, what's been the most surprising thing? Um, do you think has come out from the Mary Rose? You know, what's been the one thing you thought, "Wow, we weren't expecting that." Okay, I think it is the the recent work we're doing on the human remains, which are showing that of the the few that we've done detailed research into that four out of the eight people that we've looked at in detail seem to be non-English. So mm -hmm. including one whose father was definitely born in North Africa, because that was one that we did DNA rather than isotope analysis. So I think it's learning, it's still learning about the crew and, and about um, how diverse England was at the time. And so that in the museum, we actually have a, an exhibition which is due to end in June, which is explores diversity and the crew of the Mary Rose. So I think for me, that's one of the most astonishing things that we mm. found out and are continuing. And that is a huge reservoir. You know, we've got um, the remains of, of over, probably over 200 individuals, perhaps a bit more. And, um, and each one of those can, can potentially, as techniques get better, inform us about um, not only life and where they were born, but things like the the diseases they might have suffered, the, the genetic things they had. So how many were wheat intolerant? What can you tell by the calculus on the teeth of what the gut microbiota was? So all of these things that might wow. have the future. And, you know, that's, and we can't do too much now because a lot of this stuff is destructive at the moment. It, you know, you need to take a sample and you destroy mm -hmm. the sample in doing it. So that's why we're doing so few. But the amount of information that we're getting, suggesting things like the DNA, I mean, the DNA of the dog has been unbelievable. You know, it's a Jack Russell type of closest to the modern Jack Russell. And we knew it was just recessive for a gene that nobody thought was around at the time. It's basically gout in dogs, but it was thought to be a later thing, a more modern thing due to inbreeding. Well, we can now say, sorry, chaps, but it was around in 1545. And so there's <laughs> so much. And so I think it's it's oh, the God. science and the application of science and, and the new science. And we've seen that in just things like um, acoustics, for example. You know, we did some early trials with, with range meters on, on the hull in 75 and 82 and, and uh, various other things but now acoustics is the one thing that every but you know photogrammetry and acoustics that's it you know and those were just pioneering things now and it's the same with what we can do I think with the human remains and studying the assemblage uh, with techniques as they evolve so science and the mirrors and the assembly is just incredible so it's everything but I think you know the human remains are going to be something which humankind mm. will, will benefit from. That's amazing and that's you know as more science and uh, new technology comes on stream that it opens up new questions Absolutely. with the, the artifacts that you've already got. That's just amazing. Yeah. 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 But you wouldn't believe that you'd be able to look at things that are intact to two miles down in the, in the uh, Baltic, you know, or the Black Sea rather, you know, you just wouldn't, but now you can, and, yeah. and you can be voyeurs on that journey. Um, with Mary Rose, we we brought it up, so it's slightly different. But there, you know, there are many ships that, that will just be passengers on a on a on a voyage. But we've got a lot, and we have to look after it and continue to explore it in any way we can. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. No, it's really amazing. Yeah, just to think, you know, like Ian says, as technology advances, which is quite quick, then yeah, it opens up so many more doors yeah. and yeah, yeah, provides so much more information as well. Mm. Yeah, no, it's really interesting. So, yeah, so hopefully that will inspire people to yeah, visit the museum and learn a lot more about the Mary Rose. Well, and also, you know, people who want to be involved in underwater archaeology can join the Nautical Archaeology Society. There are loads of different levels of, um, of courses you can go on, and they have active projects that they run that allow uh, divers to, to go and join and, in, in, you know, enjoy archaeology and become part. Of, of the archaeological maritime archaeological family so um you know i would say anybody who's interested in in that and in finding a you know a different purpose to dive perhaps that they hadn't thought of before that looking at the nautical archaeology society would be a really good first step mm. yeah, yeah no i haven't heard of that one before so it'd be great to yeah try and get more yeah. people interested because i think you say archaeology and people just think of people digging holes in the ground don't they <laughs> and it's just like but taking it underwater is yeah yeah yeah, and everybody needs to have a reason to dive, really. It's Absolutely, and you can, you know, and photography is wonderful. Now you've got 
had cameras and various other things it's it's completely different ball game you know you can do photogrammetry like that whereas before you'd have to take a thousand still photographs yeah, now yeah. you just swim around the site and got six people with hat cameras and you've got something that, that you put on a headset and you've got a virtual tour so you know that, that that's fantastic the visualization but um but actually there's nothing like getting down there and looking at it and uh investigating yourself and and it's still the most marvelous feeling one of the most marvelous feelings in the world i think yeah you you had a tough bag you know uh to put up with those doing that work in such cold water um <laughs> you know that that's tough and um when you look at today we, you know we've got thermal gloves yeah. thermal uh we, we've got heated suits you know dry gloves and full face masks um uh, it, it just goes on doesn't it you know yeah. lovely nice hoods that people spent you know ages uh researching and experimenting you know how it makes them warm to wear in the in cold waters and there you were doing in wetsuits and stuff as uh, yeah tough and fenzies i mean talk about having a rubber ring around your neck sort of thing you know we've now these wonderful buoyancy compensators yeah, yeah. And, and obviously computers to to work out your dive times and any stops that you might do etc and and obviously you dive know, computers mix and yeah you know dive computers and um and different mixtures of gases that that you know, they've opened up completely different uh, avenues for underwater archaeology as well as sports night. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> um, we, we've got some set questions. We, we, you know, we fire all our guests. Um, so we'll, we'll, uh, had, we'll try these on you. Um, so if we could, if you could take three divers um, and they, they can be, they can be divers, they can be people from history, um, but you can take them with you to show them, maybe show them how it was back in the day. Who would you take? Okay, it was quite, I was in, uh, thinking about this quite a lot. And I came across a really good, the 22nd of this month was uh, Earth Day. And there was yeah. a wonderful um, speech by Sylvia Earle, Dr. Sylvia Earle, about her work. And, and obviously she's, you know, deepest untethered dive on a gym suit, etc. She set so many boundaries, oceanographer of huge repute, uh, finding, you know, out so much. And, and again, being really good at portraying it to the people. Um, and she also lived when you pioneering women in oceanography and biology with her habitat in whatever the year it was, 1970 or something, where, where mm. all the women lived at 15 meters in a habitat to see how that would work. You know, some yeah. really fantastic stuff. But she said, and I think she's right because it is my memory and probably most people of uh, my age, that it was actually Jackie Yves Cousteau who, who set the whole thing up. And yeah. she's pioneering now for, you know, the earth is being, water being the most important thing on the earth and we have to be careful of it and you know if you do something to the sea it is going to have a knock-on effect and in the end you know climate everything's going to suffer well Cousteau was saying that in this fantastic book he wrote in 1981 which is the Cousteau Almanac and it's 800 pages of world facts and about the knock-on effects of just something small like too much krill fishing mm -hmm. and it, it, it is a bible to, to live by so not only did he um, have all these wonderful pioneering ex ex expeditions and films and the stuff that he did with with cameras and he also was involved in helping with things like um, acoustic the development of acoustics and obviously we know him for the for the um, aqualung well the uh, demand valve and, aqu and and aqualung and scuba so accessibility and presenting to the public and those wonderful exhibitions and films the silent world I mean I grew up on that and so I think with his pioneering stuff. And in 1997, the United Nations accepted uh, one of the things that the Cousteau Foundation had written, which was basically, we owe it to future generations to look after the sea. And it, it I mean, it was a four page document about what we should do in order to safeguard the sea to preserve it for future generations. And that's a really big thing for, for mm -hmm. somebody, you know, to, to have done and got through the UN as, as a ratified um, important thing. So um, I'd say it would be, Jacques Cousteau without a shadow of a doubt now not yeah. just for that but for the stuff that he did for maritime archaeology and the early because he brought that to the attention by some of his films on some of the most wonderful wrecks like Antikythera which um found by by sponge fishermen in 1900s or 1907 or something and worked and brought up huge statues and various various other things um he then went back and worked it and brought up more um and brought it to the attention of 
uh, a wider audience. So, and he did that with a number of wrecks that have been found before. So bringing all those things from, from classical civilization and pre-classical civilization to modern day audiences. And that then sort of leads into my second person, which okay. is, so Jack Cousteau would have, be having to have a tour of the Mary Rose and, you know, <laughs> and also for the stuff you warned us about, about the seas, which we haven't really done very much. You know, we're not really ticked that box quite yet, um, uh, but to, to show him the Mary Rose. But also my second one would be Damien Hirst because oh, wow. he has fabricated the most fantastic story in his unbelievable shipwreck. Um, copying almost exactly the films of Cousteau. It could be a mixture of Cousteau's films and the ones we did on Chronicle to yeah, the extent yeah. that he, and again, it was sponge fishermen or, or fishermen who found the site. They, an archeologist then realized about it then went to Damien Hurst to get funding who then brought a team in who did a pre-disturbance survey. So it follows all the archeological <laughs> things correctly. And he's got these names of people and you look them up in Google, and they don't exist, you know, or the institutions that are supposed to have done a year making a version of the ship we could have carried all these things based on you know one keel bolt or something yeah the person who does it is john adams and he's he, down the road in southampton and they didn't spend a year doing making this ship so the whole lot's fabrication but what it does is it is is 189 displays in venice in 2017 did so much to um bring underwater archaeology and and you know thinking that he's spent years making these false things and weaving this wonderful story around about a slave who became free and was carrying this huge uh, lot up to, from, to, to Rome, etc. You know, fantastic story, including videos, including you, you can walk through, you can have a tour of the, uh, the exhibition, which took up like 60 rooms in two palaces in Venice in 2017 and see clips of the excavation in exactly the same way as you do see us doing it for a chronicle yeah. television yeah. program. So I think that would be fantastic. And one of the other reasons why I want him is I think it'd be great to have some of his statues either in the dockyard, because we had the kiss beside um, between uh, HMS Victory and the Mary Rose Museum, or even one of the, the huge monstery type figures um, within the Mary Rose ship hall next to the ship, or even better would be if he could build a new thing that would incorporate uh, a support for the stem and then a support for the rudder. So the Mary Rose could look, you know, you could get her full length the moment yeah. our, our cradle that we've got her on is the one we lifted her on and there's no room for adding supports for that. So. That would be my challenge for Damien Hurst and one of the ah. reasons, because I want to give him, I can't find out. It doesn't We've not had Damien that. Hurst before. Um, well, he's <laughs> the artist you know, that, does, that does all of this very controversial artwork, including this fake uh, shipwreck story in Venice, which um, which had the, you know, the public raging or <laughs> thinking it's fantastic, but is it fake or is it not fake? And you realize, that's Mickey Mouse. It's a transform. It's a transformer, you know. But then beside it, you'd have this wonderful Medusa's head that obviously had spent, ten, you know, he probably spent ten years working on these objects. And you know, the, the person who's the um, the slave, you know, his name is Sif Amatan. Well, if you look at that, it means I am not real or I'm fake or something. You know, the whole thing is a joke. And a joke. Brilliant. And it, it is brilliant, but it is great for maritime archaeology. And I like yeah. to show him the real thing. And I'd like to display his real art near our real real ship. Um, the doctor will let me, the Mary Rose Museum, this is my views only, um, would let me do it. So he would be my second person because I think he's done a lot for getting, you know, people talking about maritime archaeology. Yeah. yeah. Is, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so my third person, again, is somebody from the past rather than the present, and that's Jack Francis, which uh, we is the first named diver that we have for the Mary Rose. So he's okay. part of a team which was um, paid by uh, the, basically by the Crown to recover objects left in the Mary Rose. So it immediately the salvage attempts were made. They couldn't lift it upright. She basically rolled over in, in she's 12 meters wide. 12 meters deep, rolled over, sank, couldn't get her upright. So try, tried to do it, broke the foremast, left it for a couple of years. So then another team headed by a guy called Peter Paul Corsi, who lived in Southampton, um, came in and worked and picked up some anchors and some guns. And a member of that team was somebody called Jack Francis. And the team of divers were diving a number of wrecks around the Solent. One of them uh, was owned by some other Italians who accused them of stealing lead ingots. 
And Jack Francis, who was one of the team of Peter Paul Corsi's divers, uh, was a witness in a high court, um, a, a court of the Admiralty hearing uh, in defense of, of Corsi saying, no, the only reason why the ingots were taken is because they defaulted on the payment or whatever. But in doing so, you find out a bit about him. And he was born in the uh, Isula de Guinea, which is off West Africa. So it's possibly very close to Cape Capo Verde or something. Mm -hmm. So very close to the first um, Portuguese settlements, uh, ports over there. And then he was brought to England eventually. We don't know whether he would, he came naturally via Portuguese link or whether Corsi actually went out and got sponge divers because they were supposed to be renowned for their ability for breath holding. And within this, yeah. this transcript, it says that he was a really good breath hold diver who could pick things up. And so, and it, we've got three other names within the team as well. So we know he was the first you know, one of the names of the first divers we have is Mary Rose, had brought some stuff up. And also he was, you know, from from Guinea. So he was a, an African mm -hmm. diver. And that then again, we found out because at the same time as we were doing this, we were, we were looking at these isotope analysis of teeth so that we, we actually had a friend, you know, a, um, an African diver and then possibly, you know, an African person on the cruise. So oh, that's no. opened up a new thing. And I'd like to take him down and say, you were yeah, walking yeah. along the side of the thing that isn't here. <laughs> but this is what was below you. And can you tell me, was the bow still there in 1547? So, you know, everything's got, got an ulterior motive, but I just liked, to, and, and what were you wearing? Was it all breath hold diving? Did you have a some sort of a thing to the surface or was it a wet bell? Because wet bells were, yeah. you know, yeah were around at that time, mostly in Italy, but you know, exactly how did you do it? How did you get these guns out? I mean, it would have been the ones that would have been high up on the port side, so they would have been accessible. And he probably would have been able to walk along the side and if he stuck his hand up really high, he might've just broken the surface on certain stages of the tide, but I would like him to be it. And then I'm gonna do a wobbly with the fourth and add one that you wouldn't have had. And that would be a great, great, great grandchild of mine. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, okay. amazing. Yeah. So they can get the Mary Rose bug. Yeah, it's brilliant. Well, yeah, it's inspire the youngsters as well. That's, yeah, yeah. What it's all about getting people in the water and, yeah, just getting there and finding, yeah, a real bug for it. It's yeah. no matter what. Yeah, yeah. So if you could sort of tell somebody a nugget of from your life or a piece of advice, what would you say? to maybe maybe looking back what would you say to your your younger self now never stop doing cartwheels that would be the one because, like <laughs> because a cartwheel takes so much hey you look at it now you try doing a cartwheel now I mean I used to do them around the garden all the time and you're throwing yourself down to the ground and trying to it, it takes coordination it takes skill it takes balance and if you keep doing that for your whole life you're going to keep fit and it's going to keep your mind fit it's going to be your coordination fit so that would be good but actually my one which is and that's a very selfish thing but my one that is less selfish because I think it it um it is for everybody is never say can't just never say yes can't. always say because a it could wreck somebody's dreams and completely demoralize them it's so negative but b there is always another way to look at things and you might not be able to do exactly what the person has done but if you look at things in a different way you might be able to take baby steps towards it or you might be able to do it or you might be able to find somebody who will help you do it and and actually one thing that i've learned through Mary Rose having to ask people is usually they are really wanting to be engaged and to help and it's a it's a good for everybody feeling you know, yeah. everybody feels happy whereas if you say oh that can't be done you know forget it that can't be done oh and I bet you had that I bet you had well, that and, and, yeah, and I mean the untold stories of, of the year of salvage and recovery where you were up against a brick wall and people saying no you can't do it that way you can't do it this way well yeah. you know you just will or we'll find another way but we will do it well and i think that goes for human nature doesn't it because if, if we'd all listened to uh to that statement being told to us we would probably still be in caves uh, <laughs> we've never made it to the moon uh we've never lifted the mary rose yeah you know and the list go on you don't yeah. want to have the wheel that'll be problems <laughs> fire what's that you know like, <laughs> you'll run away and there'll be a problem so no, it's all about you know evolution as well if you said can't we would just not go anywhere but yeah yeah yeah, yeah so that would be one of yeah them. very good yeah. advice i like that that's brilliant okay another question for you um so we give you a billboard and you can put anything you like on that billboard but it's going to be a message to the world it can be a video it can be a picture it can be a statement whatever you like 
but it's got to be a message to the world. What are you going to put on it? Okay, well, the first thing I thought it would be a video and it would be the Earth from um, from outer space showing, you know, the fact it's a watery planet and then sort of that getting bigger and then the sea is actually getting smaller and smaller and smaller and then suddenly the whole world disappears and then, you know, sort of save our planet type of thing. But then I thought, well, that's actually really big and there are lots of people who are far better than me to reach out to a wider audience to do that. What can I do that, that people can make a difference now? And that would be... Um, save our sands which is a project to save the goodwin sands off the east coast of kent so it's 10 mile okay. sand bank basically which protects the kent harbor from erosion i mean the kent coast from erosion so that's one thing it was an area where in between this sand bank which is comes up to the surface very much and is a ship swallower there are over 2,000 known wrecks on it the earliest of which is 13th century there's oh, wow. sort of five wrecks from the great storm or four wrecks from the great storm of 1703 over 2,000 wrecks it is undoubtedly the largest UK reservoir of, of wrecks within it so two meters of sand is is wanting to be taken off it um, it's being delayed and delayed and delayed it's a marine protected zone of conservation zone so it's got a gray sea seal colony of 500 seals the intertidal habitat would go it's been between between the banks and it's about five miles off five to six miles four to six miles off the kent coast you've got an area called the downs which we used was a, and still is a safe anchorage during certain times of, of, of when there weren't bad, bad storms so the whole place i think there's something like over 40 airplanes that last known position during the war was around the Goodwins and they haven't been found yet. So the really? potential is enormous to cover everything from prehistoric stuff right the way up to um, to, to, to Second World War and you know, possibly even modern disasters as well. That's and to great. take two meters off the top of that just to to infill parts of the, the Western Dover, Dover Harbor you know it's probably to make a car park for lorries or something mm. it's just unbelievable and there's been this big campaign that's been going on for a few years um to save our sands and i think anybody that's something that we can all do by by um contributing towards that i think they're doing some fundraising for it but they're also trying to get public behind them to for, for a public outcry and i think that's something as, as divers that that is sort of closer to our heart and hearts and probably yeah, yeah. easier to actually really make a difference now mm -hmm. rather than a worldwide difference that that is great and we have to do it but it's not something that we can sign up to right here right now and know that it has a chance of getting somewhere yeah. yeah, yeah, and every little help, every little effort that somebody puts in helps for the yeah. bigger cause, and yeah, ultimately, yeah. And as divers, we don't want those beautiful places to erode because you erode, you know, you take it off one bit or off the top and it will have erosion. And that yeah. happens actually anyway with wrecks coming in and out of the sand because the sandbanks do move. But, you know, to do this sort of thing and it's only because it's cheaper than getting it elsewhere. You know, the, the, the costs that have been done for doing it, you know, it showed yeah. it, it's basically cheapness. It's cheaper to get the aggregate locally than it is to bring it in. And so they're saying, OK, well, the carbon footprint is bigger if you have to move it. But <laughs> the, the footprint ecologically is yeah. just huge and not, yeah. the computer modeling that's being done has been proved to not be uh, particularly accurate in something else so i have no uh, faith in it well we'll make sure there's a link to that in our yes. show notes uh, yeah. i wasn't aware of that to be honest so uh, well, well, good. Be happy with that. <laughs> yeah yeah no I wasn't aware of that. save our sands too. yeah no we'll, we'll look that up and then get yeah pop it in the show notes as well so people can yeah find out a bit more about and come to see the mary rose obviously yeah. yeah so if people want to find out more about the museum um have you got social media links where people can go just to find oh, yeah. out a bit more yeah, www.maryrose.org, and there are all sorts of Twitter and other things, and I, I'm told that our Twitter person is on there. <laughs> we, we've got a digital uh, uh, marketing person who's uh, doing yeah. all that. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, well, we'll put all the links to the actual museum and uh, the social media links so people can yeah find out a bit more and hopefully be inspired to come and visit as well. Yeah, well, yeah. thanks, and good luck with everything you do, and I have enjoyed listening to the, to the podcast that I have listened to, so cave diving ones no it's been brilliant no thank you very much for coming yeah. on and uh i think we um Gemma's never been yet no. but i think that's a, a good excuse to come down and and show you uh show Gemma the uh the wreck and uh all the artifacts and because I, I i like it because uh the way how you've got them on display uh and you've done very been very careful with light yeah how it, how it enhances them and it's easy to see them 
Um, so like that, it's brilliant. So uh, it's really nice. And definitely I'd say to anyone who's listening is uh, to go and uh, visit. It's brilliant. Yeah. Well, the, the best thing that I got is when we brought the divers in when the it, last reunion was 2017. So we just opened the new museum. The, the bottom two levels are just glass. So you can look at the ship right through it. Whereas before we only had small windows because the ship was being dried and there were all these yeah. tubes over it. Um, and they they walked down. They said, oh, my goodness, it's just like swimming down the main deck. But you can see, you know, you can see further than yeah. half a meter or a meter. And that for us... Uh, the, the few of us who'd worked on the exhibition from you know from the time it was underwater it just you know that was the best result we yeah. could ever have yeah so it's i'm glad clever. you thought it was a bit immersive you know as, a, as yeah, a, definitely you know my kids loved it uh they really enjoyed it and um you know it's totally fascinating because you kind of uh look through the window and peer at it and just kind of absorb it and take it all in and it's very cleverly presented um like i say the sound effects yeah and it's very 3d or 4d even um and you feel like you're part of it it's very very clever yeah big yeah. thumbs up yeah i'll definitely look forward to yeah yeah, yeah well you have to yeah. let me know and i'll take you around yeah. oh that'd be brilliant yeah, no, it'd be yeah. great to yeah meet you face to face as well and yeah thank you for yeah just such amazing enthusiasm and uh yeah it's very infectious yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well you guys are enthusiastic too you can hear it through all the podcasts so it's yeah. great Thank you very Brilliant. much. Thank you very okay. much. All yeah. right. Thanks a lot. Bye. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you. you okay. Bye. 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 Now that does wrap up today's episode of the Big Scuba podcast. But if you want to hear more from the podcast, make sure you hit that subscribe or follow button depending on what platform you are listening on. That way you will never miss an episode from us. But if you are listening on Apple Podcasts and did enjoy what you heard today, we would really appreciate it if you head to the show page to leave a five-star rating and review. It really does help us. If you do, please take a screenshot of that review and send it to us on Instagram and we'll give you a shout out to say a big thank you. If you have any questions for us, or anything that has been mentioned in today's episode, be sure to reach out to us on any of our social media platforms or send us an email. The links are in the show notes. We will get back to you no matter what. If you have made it to this point in the episode, we both want to say a big, big thank you for tuning in and we'll see you on the next episode.